major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. And good evening. It's Friday, November 4th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amitha Sharma, in for Maya Trabulsi. Tonight, President Joe Biden is continuing his campaign swing in Chicago after wrapping up a 19-hour visit to San Diego County. Earlier today, he spoke at a Carlsbad tech company promoting the recently passed Chips and Science Act. KPBS reporter Jacob Ayer was there. President Joe Biden came to Carlsbad to talk about microchip and semiconductor production. But he began his remarks with praise for veterans. Veterans are literally the spine, the very sinew of what America is. Biden spoke at the headquarters of Viasat, a broadband satellite company. He said companies like Viasat will get an economic boost from the Chips and Science Act that he signed in August. Today we're down to producing 30% of the world's chips from 30% to only 10% despite leading the world in research and design of new chip technology. Biden says the act includes a historic investment to try and surge production of American-made semiconductors and tackle supply chain issues to make more goods in the U.S. One-third of the core inflation due to last year, last year, one-third of it was because of the price of automobiles. Why? They couldn't get computer chips. They had to shut down their lines, fewer cars being made, Prices went up because they're in, in short supply because of computer chips. The bill sets aside more than $50 billion for subsidies to build chip plants in the U.S. and support U.S. chip research and development. Instead of relying on chips made overseas, could be delayed because of a pandemic or some global disruption. Now they're going to be able to have those chips available on the spot. The act also provides a 25% tax credit for building and equipping U.S. chip plants. Jacob Ayer. KPBS News. The president's visit to Carlsbad followed a campaign stop in Oceanside last night. KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne was there and shows us how the night unfolded. President Joe Biden was greeted by Governor Gavin Newsom, San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria, and 49th District Representative Mike Levin as he touched down at MCAS Miramar on Thursday. From there, the president headed to Maricosta College in Oceanside for a campaign rally in support of Congressman Mike Levin. This guy delivers. He delivers. He lowers costs for families, caring for our veterans, protecting the environment. These are big deals. Rebuilding our infrastructure, protecting Social Security and Medicare. And, and he's fighting to protect democracy. Biden's visit to support Levin comes after the 49th district race was labeled a toss-up by the nonpartisan Cook Political Report. We got just five days to go. And tonight I need you all to pledge to join us at one of our campaign offices in Carlsbad or Laguna Niguel over these next five days to help us get out the vote. Will you help us get out the vote? Republican candidate Brian Marriott is closing in on Levin for the 49th district seat. If Levin loses the race, Republicans could take majority control in the House. Outside of Maricosta College, supporters of Marriott and the Republican Party protested the president's visit. The California GOP released a statement calling the visit a last-ditch effort by Levin to save his job. But inside the gym, the crowds roared in support of Levin and Biden. I think he did an okay job. I feel good about it. I was expecting most of the things that he did say, and it, I liked the crowd. It was very energetic. I think there's a lot to be proud of, the prescription drug um, bills, everything they've done, but I think somehow we don't know about it as much. The message hasn't gotten out, and I really want to celebrate that. And I think the crowd really got energized when we wanted to protect a woman's health care, and that's the message. we got to keep that. And every time Roe was mentioned, the, the floor just rumbled, and I know everybody was just stepping on, you know, making the floor 
like shake and quake. So I think that's going to be like the hidden issue that a, a lot of people are voting for. This is the first time I've ever seen a president or any government related person in, in person. And I think it's very cool being able to hear everything up front. And it sounded really good. I'm liking everything I'm hearing. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking that hopefully if we win on this vote on Tuesday was, I think we'll be in a good future. Election day is Tuesday, November 8th. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. If you haven't cast your ballot yet, you don't have to wait until Election Day. An additional 179 vote centers are opening tomorrow. That will make a total of 218 centers, which replace polling places. The hours are 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock in the evening through Monday, November 7th. On Election Day, centers open an hour earlier and close at 8 o'clock that night. You can vote in person or drop off a mail-in ballot. You can also register to vote or update your voter registration and vote on the same day. We have locations on our website, kpbs.org. Just click on the Voter Hub tab. A strange political predicament in Chula Vista. A dead candidate is still in the running. Coming up, why he still has party support and what happens if he wins the election. Governor Gavin Newsom is telling cities across California to do better with their plans to deal with homelessness. Until they do, he has halted state funding for those projects. San Diego is one of the affected cities. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado has reaction from San Diego's city council president. San Diego Council President Sean Elo Rivera shared some good news on homelessness. San Diego housed 12,000 people who were experiencing homelessness over the past year. 12,000. That doesn't mean move them into shelter. That means move them into permanent housing. But in the next breath, he gave the reason it isn't making an impact on the streets of California's second largest city. However, in that same amount of time, about 15,000 people fell into homelessness. This comes on the heels of some tough news for San Diego and every city relying on state funding to deal with homelessness. Governor Gavin Newsom has stopped payment on those grants, saying in a statement that Californians demand accountability, not status quo. And the city's plans collectively would only reduce homelessness by 2% statewide by 2024. Newsom said this approach is unacceptable and everyone has to do better. So far, the state has given over $1.5 billion and the third round would dole out another billion. I think the governor's response is the same response that so many of us have, which is that the status quo is unacceptable. That we're not making progress fast enough and um, and in too many places, we're slipping backwards. Elo Rivera says he gets it, and the city leadership is committed to solving this crisis. I think that the governor's challenge to us yesterday um, should be, um, if we needed any additional motivation, that should be it, that we've got to take a different approach. Uh, to what we're currently doing now. He says the state withholding those funds will not put any of the city's programs in jeopardy this year, but it does make it more urgent to update their plans. We don't want to see any interrupt interruptions, obviously. I think we can maintain continuity now while also adapting and ensuring that we make the changes necessary to make real progress. And in order to make real progress, Ilo Rivera says one of the critical steps the city must take is to pass tenant protections. We are acting with urgency to stem the tide of people who are becoming homeless so that San Diegans can start to see some progress on this issue that I think is having huge, huge impacts on our community, on our psyche as a community, and is a humanitarian crisis. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. The latest jobs report released today is giving us a clearer snapshot of the strength of the U.S. economy. As a whole, employers keep on hiring, but the unemployment rate rose slightly since September. Ivan Rodriguez breaks down the latest numbers and the impact it's having across the country. Just days away from the midterm elections, latest polling shows one of the biggest concerns for voters in both parties remains the state of the economy making the latest monthly jobs report even more important. We saw another robust gain in total employment of 261,000. What this tells us is that there really aren't any true job cracks yet forming in the labor market. 
Economist Joe Brusuela says although the unemployment rate jumped two-tenths of a percentage point to 3.7 percent in October, what the country is seeing is in part a result of long-term demographic trends. We have more than 10,000 baby boomers retiring a day, and we saw roughly about 358,000 people exit the labor force in what we call the household survey that's used to derive the unemployment rate. For some in the restaurant industry, the latest numbers paint a sobering picture of where the economy is headed. According to the National Restaurant Association, in recent months, many restaurants have increased menu prices while also reducing hours of operation. Chef Bobby Flay says he's already seeing a shift in the industry. Restaurants are going to have to keep charging more money to survive. And for Bruce Willis, the pace of hiring remains robust and overall, the unemployment rate remains relatively low. Your job is not at risk. But what it does mean is the economy is in transition. You're going to see hiring freezes. It may become a little bit more difficult to switch jobs or to get a new one at higher pay. Ivan Rodriguez, KPBS News. A program to help women in the military transition to civilian life is returning for its seventh year. KPBS reporter Melissa May has the story of Operation Dress Code. It's not really a handout, it's a hand up, and it's just, we've all been there. When Randy McLean retired from the Navy in 2009, she saw many programs that helped male service members transition to civilian life, but no assistance was available for her and her fellow female veterans. When I transitioned out, um, I didn't know where to turn either. Now there's Operation Dress Code San Diego. It's an opportunity for female veterans and active duty to receive business clothes, shoes, accessories, and lots of other things that they may need as they transition to the civilian workforce. The Dress Code Boutique is stocked to assist about 500 women thanks to their community partners. But this isn't just a one-day shopping spree with a personal stylist. They can get their hair and makeup done and have LinkedIn profile pictures done for them on site. They're also able to engage in breakout sessions. So we have the Wounded Warrior Project there doing resume writing, um, again, building that profile for them. McLean wants to help fellow service women easily transition to civilian life. So really just kind of bringing down that barrier for these ladies is that first step. And then helping them translate those skills. We come out with such amazing transferable skills, but just empowering them to know what those differences are and help them um, transition to that civilian workforce. Many of the volunteers are military veterans and benefited from Operation Dress Code, including Cassandra Johnson. This is Johnson's third year volunteering as a way to pay it forward. I'm happy with them. I'm weeping with them. It just gives them a sense of release. You can just see people, they're smiling. Some people aren't talking, but they're taking it all in. They're knowing that and feeling that people are there to support them. The donations don't just magically appear on the racks at the boutique. Volunteers like Linda Kolker sorted through over 5,000 donated items. Coker is one of the many personal stylists who assist the service women on November 5th. The opportunity to be able to help someone and to help pick, help them pick out the right clothes that they're comfortable in that will make them feel good about themselves and make them feel like they're important and that they've got this. All services are free and appointments are still available for active duty or veteran service women. Signups are available at operationdresscode.org. Melissa May. KPBS News. Senator Dianne Feinstein is making history this week, becoming the longest serving female U.S. Senator. The 89 year old California Democrat marks her 30th anniversary in the Senate tomorrow. Feinstein was elected in 1992 when there were only two women senators. Now there are 24 and we have a female vice president. In a statement, Feinstein thanked the people of California for electing her and said she still has more work to do. The San Diego Democratic Party is promoting a dead candidate in the Chula Vista city attorney race. KPBS reporter Gustavo Solis says if the late Simon Silva wins, the city may be forced to spend $2 million in a special election. Democrat Simon Silva won the primary with 49% of the votes. He was endorsed by Mayor Mary Salas and the San Diego County Democratic Party. All of that made him a heavy favorite to defeat his opponent, Dan Smith, in the general election. That is until the 56-year-old died of cancer in early September. In addition to being a tragedy, Silva's death also complicates Chula Vista's election. 
so much so that city council members asked for legal advice during a public meeting in September. They wanted to know what would happen if Silva wins. City Clerk Carrie Bigelow gave them their answer. But if there is a vacancy, then the only option is a special um, a special election. Right. And the council can choose among those election dates and the type of election it right. wants to hold. Bigelow says that a special election would cost Chula Vista taxpayers between $1.5 and $2 million. And Chula Vista doesn't have that kind of money to spend. The city has a structural budget deficit that's forced the city council to cut services in recent years. So it's come as a bit of a shock to some residents that Mayor Salas and other Democrats are still campaigning for Silva, even though electing him would cost the city millions. One local resident asked the mayor why she continues to publicly support the dead candidate. Why, Madam Mayor, are you promoting Simone Silva for office by placing a sign in your front yard. That puzzles me and it makes me feel like our city council and our mayor are playing politics with this election. The mayor was visibly offended by the question. I think it's shameful that you're bringing this up. I have his sign in my yard is in memory of him as a as a gesture of respect and so I think the only ones that are being disrespectful here are the ones that are talking about us playing politics with this. Salas said that she couldn't really understand how people might interpret a campaign sign on her front lawn as a political statement. It's just beyond belief to me and for you to even ask me what my motives are on putting a sign in my yard to respect somebody it's not politics. It's about love of a man that had a terrific character. And it's just appalling to me that that would be interpreted that way. But that's exactly how a number of people are interpreting it, including Smith, Silva's Republican opponent. He says that city leaders and the local Democratic Party are still outwardly supporting the deceased candidate. I think that the, the city in general, that the voters would, uh, would think that uh, the $1.5 million, I believe, that Ms. Bigelow was talking about would be so much better spent police officers, firefighters, removing graffiti, homeless, all these issues. The local Democratic Party did not respond to a request for comment. To make this election even more uncertain, there is one scenario in which the city council could appoint a city attorney instead of holding a special election. If Silva wins, the city charter stipulates that current city attorney Glenn Guggens would remain in office until the special election. But what happens if Guggens resigns? An outside counsel, Alina Shamos, had the answer. If uh, Mr. Guggens does resign, then it is our interpretation of the charter that there is some discretion for the city council to appoint a new city attorney. However, Guggens confirmed this week that he plans to continue serving as the interim city attorney until his successor is elected. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. It's not just the sports gambling propositions getting a lot of money this election cycle. SDSU's Miro Kopik tells us about a couple of local measures getting attention from the business community in the Friday Business Report. Locally, we have two initiatives. Measure C, which lifts the height requirement of 30 feet at, near the sports arena. Over a million dollars has been invested in that with a half a million dollar investment uh, provided by Midway Rising, which is the firm that was selected by the mayor and the city council to build out the new sports arena and complex over there. The other measure, which has received almost two and a half million dollars in funding, Measure D which is a, a controversial measure that lifts the city's ban on kind of a union-friendly project labor agreements. About a million and three quarters is being invested to, to support the lifting of that ban, and about 850,000 is against. So there's a major impact here uh, for the construction trades. So those two measures in particular are very important to business leaders uh, on, on either side in, in the city, and, and the gambling measures are of, of big interest to a lot of organizations throughout the state and outside. We have more election coverage at kpbs.org. The KPBS Voter Hub is where you'll find stories explaining key local races as well as an in-depth ballot guide. You can get there by clicking the link on our homepage. 
Delmar Beach is closed for at least 48 hours after a swimmer was bit by a shark. Lifeguards said a woman was swimming with a friend about 100 yards offshore this morning when she was bit. Lifeguards said she suffered leg wounds. The beach is closed for a mile in each direction as a precaution. The waters off our coast are a nursery for white sharks, although lifeguards say bites are rare. Lighter mornings and darker evenings are on the way as daylight saving time comes to an end this weekend. At 2 a.m. Sunday, clocks will turn back one hour and revert to standard time. It comes as lawmakers debate whether the long-standing tradition should be eliminated. The Senate approved the bipartisan Sunshine Protection Act in March, which would make daylight saving time permanent, but the bill has stalled in the House. Part of the argument is that time change can throw off sleep schedules. Mandy Gaither has some advice from experts about easing into the change. Seasonal after. If shifting your clock has you reaching for another cup of joe in the morning, you're not alone. When you lose an hour or gain an hour, you're playing with your body's clock overall, and this can cause a lot of different consequences. Neurologist Mari Horvat with Cleveland Clinic Sleep Disorder Center says it's easier to see the struggle to the time change in spring, but falling back can be hard on your body as well. That's why she says it's important to make some changes now, gradually shift your internal clock by adjusting sleep and wake times by 15 or 20 minutes a day. It might seem like it's a small change. It might seem like, gosh, I get this extra time to sleep in, but it really can have detrimental effects and especially on our mood overall. Horvat says limiting caffeine and alcohol before bed can help too. Exercise and sun exposure can also allow your body to be sleepy at the right time. We're asking our bodies to make this change that we're not giving the right input for, right? When it's light outside, we should be awake. When it's dark, we should be going to sleep. We're going against what our bodies fundamentally built for. So it's normal that this can be a difficult thing for people. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. As we fall back, the San Diego County Water Authority says it's also a good time to cut back on your outdoor watering needs. It's especially important as we enter a fourth straight year of drought. Officials say plants don't need as much water during cooler months and they don't need irrigation for several days after heavy rains. Let's start with your weather headlines because it's going to be another pretty chilly night ahead. And then as we head into the weekend, we are starting with quiet weather. Most of the weekend, no issues. But as we head into late Sunday night and then into next week, we're going to be watching this Pacific storm bringing significant precip and wind. So we're going to get into that. Let's start with tonight's lows, though. Again, I mentioned another chilly one. A lot of 30s and 40s across the map. I think San Diego still stays right around 51. Oceanside, though, 41. Borrego Springs, 41. 44 and Mount Laguna dropping to 38. Heading into tomorrow, it's not going to be as cool. It still will be a little below average in some spots, but quiet weather moves on in. And then as we head into our Saturday afternoon, this is what temperatures will look like. So upper 60s in San Diego are back into the upper 70s, Borrego Springs, Mount Laguna 61, and Oceanside at about 69. What happens for our Sunday? Well, again, most of us still mainly dry at this point, comfortable air kind of moves back on in, so not as cool, but you already see those showers sinking farther south uh, into places like San Francisco and Fresno. But our setup as we head into early next week, we're going to be watching this major Pacific storm, and that's going to bring rain all the way down to San Diego and L.A. and a lot of snow as well. It's, of course, much needed rainfall for us. We're talking about a flash flood risk, though, and then feet of snow possible in the Sierra Nevada. Let's look at what that looks like along the coast. It's Monday and Tuesday that we're watching those showers hours and then the wind really moving in on Tuesday, drying out then by Wednesday. Same story inland. It's going to be those showers moving in Monday, but the main action comes on Tuesday. We'll have some windy conditions and then drying out again on Wednesday. In the mountains, the rain on Monday and then very windy conditions with the rain on Tuesday. And taking a look, even in the desert, we're watching those showers move on in from Monday and Tuesday and then drying out again by Wednesday. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Ariella Scalise. 
Here's another look at today's top stories. President Joe Biden continued his visit to San Diego's North County, promoting the recently passed Chips and Science Act. He came to Carlsbad to talk about microchip and semiconductor production at the headquarters of Viasat, a broadband satellite company. Biden says the act includes a historic investment of $50 billion to try and surge production of American-made semiconductors and tackle supply chain issues to make more goods in the U.S. And Governor Newsom has blocked a billion dollars in funding for local governments to address homelessness, saying they didn't go far enough. He rejected every application from counties and large cities for the state funding, including San Diego. Council President Sean Ilovera says withholding those funds will not put any of the city's programs in jeopardy this year, but makes it more urgent to update their plans. The Powerball jackpot is now the world's largest lottery prize ever offered. The jackpot has grown to an estimated $1.6 billion, that's billion with a B, that beats the last world record of $1.8 $5.8 billion, also set by Powerball in 2016. The jackpot has been growing for three months. The next drawing is tomorrow. If someone wins, they can choose to get the entire sum of money in gradual payments over 29 years or a lump sum payment of over $782 billion. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.